Recently, there has been a bit of buzz within the Genshin Impact community regarding the fact that none of the playable Liyue characters besides Zhao showed up in the Lantern Raid event. And I agree that it is kind of disappointing. The event's trailer showed many of our favorite characters walking around Liyue, interacting with the environment, and making the world feel alive. But instead of becoming a part of that, we are subjected to fetch quests for a bunch of different NPCs. I still think the event was enjoyable, but that lack of interaction made it really feel like something was missing. This situation has made me appreciate story quests even more. They give us real insight into the personalities of these characters, how they act, what they like. We get to know them in a way that is much more engaging than reading blocks of text. Another thing which I don't really see anybody mention is the fact that in some of these story quests, other playable characters will unexpectedly appear. I really appreciate this because it makes the world actually feel real through its connections. It's not like each character exists in their own bubble. They should be interacting with each other because many of their stories overlap. But anyways, today I will be talking about my own analysis of Venti's story quest, Carmen Day Chapter, Act 1, Should You Be Trapped in a Windless Land. I chose this one out of the 16 that are currently available because I specifically remember how unexpectedly emotionally moved I was, but I'll get back to that later. I was originally going to summarize the events of the quest as I talked, but I came to realize that the quest takes around 50 minutes or so to complete, so doing so would make this video a bit too long. So I recommend you play the quest before watching the rest of this video if you haven't already, and if it's just been a while, here's a very shortened summary. Our story begins with the Traveler and Paimon in Mondstadt City when Paimon notices a young girl playing around all by herself. And while Paimon is creeped out, the Traveler suggests the girl is playing with her imaginary friend. Venti appears saying he is testing out one of Lisa's inventions, which coincidentally can be used to see imaginary friends. So the three go around the city, observing children's imaginary friends, and the adults' lack of them. Ellen, who is not quite an adult yet, has an imaginary friend that is surprisingly Jean. After training with her, she realizes she forgot she was going to make adventure plans with Jack, a new adventurer. But of course she is too sore now, so she entrusts us with letting Jack know. Jack is in the Temple of the Lion with Stanley, a legendary adventurer renowned in all of Mondstadt for setting foot in the Mare Javari, which is a dangerous place where no wind blows. We find them and rescue them from some monsters before going all the way through the rest of the temple. The whole time Stanley is talking about how great he is and how awesome his stories are. Venti suggests seeing if Stanley has an imaginary friend, and sure enough he has one resembling a man with a scarred face, as if it were an idealized version of himself. Stanley leaves, but Jack asks the group to help him find the Sword of Brilliant Valor and the Shield of Magnificent Honor, which were once used by Mondstadt's greatest hero, Vanessa. He heard about them from Stanley, and hopes that having them will allow his family to recognize his desire to become an adventurer. They find the Sword and Shield in Dadalupa Gorge, but notice that they are not very legendary looking weapons. However, Venti is able to convince Jack that they are the things he is looking for. Venti notices that Stanley has been sneaking around this whole time and confronts him, but Stanley makes up some excuses and gets away. Later that night at the Angel's Share, we find a drunk Stanley talking to himself, explaining that Stanley is actually his partner who sacrificed himself in the marriage of Ari. This Stanley took his friend's name and boasts tales of legendary adventures so that Mozart won't forget the real Stanley's adventurer's legacy. Jack walks in and tells everyone that because of the sword and shield, his parents will now support his dream of becoming an adventurer, and then he leaves. Stanley thanks us for not telling Jack and preserving his pure adventurer's spirit, then explains that he is getting old and is starting to forget things about the real Stanley. Venti uses his Archon powers to free Stanley's spirit using the memories from Hans Archibald. We leave and meet Venti on the Barbados statue, and he explains how he became the Animo Archon. The first thing I want to talk about is how the quest takes advantage of its non-playable characters to build on the world. Genshin is honestly one of the best games out there when it comes to breathing character into its NPCs and making me care about them. We trained with Ellen multiple times for our daily commissions, and here we see her continuing to work hard. Timmy has achieved meme status, and it's just funny that he is a massive ruin guard as his imaginary friend. Flora has a very innocent mind, and it makes sense that she would only know about Blody Floaties from Stanley's Adventure Tales not only because he is famous in Mondstadt, but because she is young enough to have never gone out and seen one for herself. And although they are not NPCs and had a very minor role in the quest, it is cool that we got to see Diluc and Kaya just hanging out. These small details really make Mondstadt feel like a community, and not just some place I have to walk through to get stuff done for the game. Moving on to actual analysis, I want to begin with the use of imaginary friends as a plot device. 
we are gradually given information which builds on our understanding of how they work in this world, which is necessary given how abstract the concept of an imaginary friend is. Flora and Timmy's showed us that they are idealized and have no restrictions physically or characteristic-wise. Ellen's showed us that an imaginary friend can be an imitation of someone real. And the group of adults demonstrated that after reaching a certain level of maturity, you probably won't have one at all. As we eventually find out, the spirit of Stanley is a culmination of all of these things. Ellen's relationship to Jean is very similar to Hans's relationship to Stanley. They both have a role model that they look up to and want to become. The quality of being idealized shows when Hans admits that he is forgetting things about the real Stanley, implying that he is starting to make stuff up in order to maintain Stanley's prestige. Lastly, Hans has an imaginary friend at all because he is stuck in the past and has never moved forward since Stanley's death. Rather than just showing Stanley's spirit and expecting us to accept it, we are subtly eased into the idea of it. Even in a fantasy world where nothing is expected to be realistic, having things make sense within the context of the world preserves the suspension of disbelief and makes storytelling much more compelling. The device used to see imaginary friends is called a Nernama Detector, which has components imported from Sumeru, the dendro region known for its academia. Nernama is a word from Hinduism, which makes sense given that Sumeru is supposedly inspired by ancient Arabian, Egyptian, and Indian cultures. The definition that best fits this context is a turning point. Fenty explains that Lisa can't actually use a Nernama detector herself, possibly because she lacks a sense of childlike wonder. This leads me to believe that it not only detects the presence of an imaginary friend, but also detects if the user has crossed a turning point in their life where they no longer believe that imaginary friends exist. Stanley is such an interesting character, and a lot of that has to do with how the quest builds up our expectations, then completely subverts them multiple times. We first hear about Stanley and how amazing he is from Flora, then Ellen. At this point, we have no reason to doubt Stanley's authenticity, given that he was praised by multiple people and clearly has an established reputation in Monsat. But when we rescued him in the Temple of the Lion and he claimed he didn't need our help, I think everyone got the impression that this guy was faking it. When we see his imaginary friend, Venti wonders if it is the idealized version of himself. And that would make sense, given what we had already seen of imaginary friends this far. This image of a perfect adventurer to guide Stanley and give him confidence. Everything with the sword and shield and Stanley keeping tabs just comes off as someone who was caught too deep in a lie. Part of why this negative characterization of Stanley is convincing is because Genshin Impact is not afraid to make NPCs dislikable. Timmy is hated on mostly as a joke, but Reckless Palette is seriously annoying. We expect Stanley to be yet another unapologetically frustrating character, but our entire perspective takes a 180 when we realize that the real Stanley died in the marriage of Ari. Survivor's guilt is a very real thing, and the circumstances for Hans's situation only bolsters how bad it is for him. Survivor's guilt most commonly happens when one person, by chance, survives an accident where others have died. Usually the survivor wonders if there was anything they could have done to prevent the death of others, but there isn't. Hans, however, directly caused Stanley's death by being inexperienced and needing to be saved. One can only imagine how mentally taxing an event like that would be, especially given the fact that Hans doesn't seem to have any friends or family to rely on for support. We go from hating this arrogant man to heavily sympathizing with his grievances and his noble cause of maintaining his friend's legacy. He threw away his own life, dedicating it to passing on the spirit of adventure to promising rookies. Stanley acted confident and cocky, because Hans did not want anyone to think of Stanley as anything other than the greatest, but behind that delusion, Hans is a sad and self-loathing man. This story is a lesson that as much as you want to dislike someone because of some of their qualities, there will always be things behind the scenes that are causing them. One small change in view can completely change how we interpret someone else's character. I really hope we get to see more of Stanley in future material and how he will grow from here on out. Of course, I can't analyze Venti's story quest without talking about Venti himself. He takes more of a backseat compared to the other characters in their own story quests, but I don't think that undermines his value here. In the quest, Venti is very much a driving force for the plot. He gives us the Nernama detector so we can explore the idea of imaginary friends. When we notice that the sword and shield are fake, Venti still goes along with the act, making up convincing words on the spot. While I don't think Venti knew everything about Stanley right away, before going to the angel's chair, he asks, someone who can't let go of the past and gives up on the present instead. I wonder, if such a person was forced to take their first steps towards the future, which way would they go? This along with the fact that Venti invited us to the angel's chair in the first place seems to indicate that he came to his own solid conclusions. Although Venti has a carefree, mischievous personality, he's definitely more clever than he lets on. The end of the quest really drives home the contrast between Hans and Venti. Although they both took on the identity of their lost friend and shared their wishes with the rest of the world, Hans lived as Stanley, while Venti lives for the sake of his friend. 
Seeing as how Venti has lived for thousands of years and seen many companions come and go, we can only imagine how tough that might be for him. Behind that silly smile, he certainly has endured many, many hardships. But despite that, Venti has never lost sight of himself, and he doesn't try to be something he's not. He may have taken on the appearance of his friend and become a bard in his honor, but at the end of the day, he will always dedicate himself to maintaining the freedom of Mondstadt and the happiness of its people. This is shown when Venti intervenes with his godly powers to help Hans reconnect with his true self, giving him the push he needed towards the future. And my closing final remark is that the soundtrack really hits hard, completely complementing the emotions we feel throughout the quest. Thank you, Mihoyo, for this amazing experience. Since most of what I said was just my own speculation, it's very possible that none of this quest was intended to be interpreted this way, but that's what makes it kind of fun. I hope you enjoyed this as well. It's kind of ironic that I used to really hate English class and reading comprehension, but here I am making essays of my own free will. I want to make more of these videos for other story quests, so keep an eye out for polls on the community tab to vote for which one I should do first. Thank you so much for the amazing support on the channel as of lately, and as always, thank you for watching this video.